Hello, and welcome to The Confident Commit, the podcast for anyone who wants to join the conversation on delivering software better and faster. If you're looking to build a toast and chip, tune in less confidently commit. I'm your host, Rob Zuber, CTO of Circle CI, the leader in all things CI and CD. And today I'm joined by Alex Williams from the New Stack. Alex, so great to see you again. I feel like we just saw each other with so many things that I'm excited to talk to you about because you sit in such an interesting position in the industry. But let's just talk about how is the industry evolving? How is that helping us you know, deliver software better, meet, more importantly, meet the needs of our customers? You know, with software, I think, you know, in the supply chain um, and how you secure it is... Um, you know, how do you think about, you know, API management mm. uh, is, you know, an ongoing discussion. I think that we're going to see more of. Um, there's also uh, more discussion, I think, about, um, uh, you know, what is the best programming language to use? And, you know, uh, now we're looking at, you know, there's such an interest in Rust right now. Um so, well, I, I'm interested in, in both those things. I mean, languages are like a lifelong experience. I've been in this industry for a really yeah. long time and will never settle. So I, I, I mean, yeah. I, I, I struggle to engage in it, but I think it's an interesting one to observe. But APIs, I think, are really, really fascinating. We used to be talking about, a lot about distributed systems, right? So you end up in organizations that are you know, building out microservices, using Kubernetes to orchestrate all this stuff, trying to give teams autonomy to deliver. Right, and we're all about delivering quickly and, and iterating quickly, but you know the API is often what you're exposing to your customer, right? Depend, depending on your tool set, like maybe not if you're a rug shop, but right. in a lot of cases, right? And crafting good APIs uh, as as a product while giving space for teams to work independently and not think about that centralized management is, I think, a very common problem, both from a a tooling perspective, like are, are we reinventing all the you know all the wheels, I guess, with respect to how to deliver APIs effectively? But then also from a you know depending if if your customer is a developer like ours, your API is part of the product, right? And so um, can you do that in a way that's that feels consistent, like a consistent user interface versus just something for a machine to talk to? So I'm curious what what you saw coming up if there's you know, people solving that from a product perspective, new sort of approaches that folks are taking on, you know, what, what were you seeing with that respect? Endpoint management, mm -hmm. you know, is a, is a, you know, is, is, is a hot uh, topic, uh, you know, so you are, you know, just being more kind of attuned to, uh, you know, what, what, uh, you know, what is getting, uh, what is open to the, you know, the end user, um, you know, the there's lots of different ways that you can you know protect yourself um by you know uh limiting what you're actually providing you know through those endpoints um permissions for instance um mm -hmm. you know is, is is a big one um you know that's one you know that's one of the topics i think also um you in the, the question is about uh, how do you think about you know your overall posture um, if you're distributing lots and lots of APIs. So like you know just if you're I mean if you're using lots of APIs, like how do you think about kind of the authentications that you have? Mm -hmm. um, and this is where services like Okta really come into play, you know, and the identity providers. And I think identity issues are going to you know, continue to be a, um, a big one for people. There's a lot of questions about, you know, uh, you know, how do you actually authenticate by not, you know, by uh, uh, verifying both endpoints, you know, there's, it's just, it's kind of an endless discussion, I mean, about API security. Well, I think you know, we talk about API security, we talk about supply chain security. I think the most interesting thing in all of that is you, it's like we could just go and go and go. Those are their own spaces, yeah. right? Which is not to say that we can leave them removed, but the, the skills, the expertise that go into thinking about these problems of identity authentication, identity mapping, mm -hmm. um, they're hard problems. And then inside your organization you're distributing out into teams you're building services 
And then saying, okay, cool, we'll just, you know, there's a reason that Okta is successful and Auth0, which I yeah. has been acquired by Okta, or I'm not sure what state the acquisition is yeah. in, but because that stuff's, re- it's, it's fundamental. Um, I'll say it's hard and it's, it can be a time suck, right? Again, all these things that we pursue when, you know, I'll use our example, we're, we're trying to deliver CI and CD to folks. We're not trying to deliver amazing authentication, right? That's something that we can, we yeah. can get from somewhere. And I think, you know, this notion of kind of unburdening our developers a little bit from all that we've dumped on them by saying, you know what, we, this is a solved problem. Here's your limited way that you can interact with it. Focus on the stuff that's in your domain or whatever. That That's really helpful. And identifying those and then saying, you know what, this isn't even our business. Like, yeah. Yeah. it's it's why you see all these vendors at a, at a KubeCon, right? Because they're solving problems that are consistently being solved across multiple organizations that are just, they're hard problems in their own right. And I think they're in a way getting harder because of some capabilities that we've enabled for ourselves. We're all moving faster and we want these problems to be solved. Um, but then you end up, you know, with a, uh, I'm trying to think of the right expression, but the, the, just the challenges of too many choices, right? So now it's, it's almost a different skill set that we're building to be able to look at multiple third-party vendors and say, oh, this is the one that meets our needs. Therefore, we're going to, you know, to, to use that, right? Like a, when, I, when I started in software development, we talk about this a lot from the perspective of how people are building. We wrote a lot of the software ourselves because those were the choice. That was the choice. If you needed something, you wrote it, right? And that's a different skill set in a way. I'm curious if you're seeing that evolve in terms of, you know, yes, you see these vendors and stuff, but are you, are you seeing people thinking about their roles differently, you know, where now to get things to, a, you know, to my customer, I'm, I'm gluing these pieces together. And my job is about evaluating the best pieces to stitch together versus, you know, the best algorithms to stitch together. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's been going on for a while, right? You know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, what is you know, what once was the responsibility of like a very sophisticated, you know, networking engineer is now the job of someone who, you know, didn't, you know, uh, get their education in, in network engineering or, or they mm-hmm. just kind of learned it on the job. And, uh, but now they're responsible for it. And, you know, and I think that's like a lot of, uh, uh, that has a lot of impact on, 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 on people and, you know, and their, and in how they work inside companies are like, wait a second, that's my job. That's, that's not your job. I mean, that's what I do. And that's fast. That's a kind of a fascinating kind of shift because uh, it means that, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the question then is like, where's, where's the opportunity, you know, for that, you know, you know, for people, I think it's, you know, increasingly it's going to, you know, people are going to be integrators, right? They're going to mm. be, you know, that's where the value is, but there's a lot more underneath there that, that uh, gets pretty complicated. And, you know, one topic that did come up a lot is it's almost like you think of, you know, security from a service uh, context. Um, and how do you think about sec- security operations um, mm. and how does it, you know, how does it meld? How does it integrate with DevOps and GitOps? But the question then becomes is like, and I think this one question we'll start to see kind of start to get answered over the next year or two is what is, you know, what, in, what encompasses the actual supply chain itself, right? Because, you know, you start thinking about like security operation services and it's a bit like infrastructure as code, right? Now it's like, you know, security is code. You know, you're trying to think about the code and how you can think about it the same way you think about infrastructure as code. And infrastructure as code and DevOps are very similar. They're both, you know, have, you know, a basis in, in uh, version control, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but GitOps is kind of a different kind of a, a a different kind of a, a beast, right? It's much, it's more really for Kubernetes really than anything else. And so then the question becomes, I think this is going to be a big, big question um, uh, over the, you know, o- over time is how do you synchronize everything, right? How do you synchronize across the entire supply chain? If even if like, you know, people are using desktops to, to, uh, you know, to do their, to do their code development. Like, where do you, how do you, you know, how are we kind of like 
defining this very amorphous concept of, of you know, that is a supply chain. Yeah, well, so when you when you say the amorphous concept, like, yes, the supply chain is amorphous. And I think the thing that we're, we're struggling to put our finger on now is the application, right? Like at the end of the day, as a customer comes in and experiences something, what they're experienced is comprised of everything that came out of that supply chain from yeah. third party services like Okta to the third party libraries that I'm using to the custom code that was built by the company whose site I'm visiting. And then all the infrastructure underneath that provided by some cloud provider that they don't know anything about. Right. And, you know, use the word synchronize, and I would I would posit that we never will, right? You'll never get a snapshot that says, "Cool, this is the exact state of all the data that's under there." The you know the ML model that's driving this thing, the code that was interject you know injected, the third party services. <laughs> so so what we have to prepare ourselves for is to sort of ride on top of all of that change and and kind of mitigate risk, right? There's just a constant injection of change and risk. And so how do we build systems that are resilient to that versus how do we prevent that, right? There's just, there's no, you know, pushing back all of these changes and saying, no, we're happy with this snapshot of reality and we're just going to keep that for a while. Um, and so it feels like the the rate of change is increasing to a point where where that's our only are you, are you, I mean, I'm going to ask you a question. Are you seeing any interest in like training the data better so you can start developing, you know, almost inference models, you know, so that can be applied into software uh, development? In, in software delivery? Ab absolutely. I mean, we're, delivery. we're sitting, you know, as Circle CI. So, I see two views, right? One, how do we build software? And then how do we help others build software? Right. They're obviously related, but, uh, you know, two perspectives. And so as we help others, you know, we, we have so much visibility into what's happening in the software delivery world, I guess, because of where we sit, all the customers that we have, that the opportunity to reflect back, hey, there's there's risk over here. This thing has changed. It's impacting other people. Um, is something that's that's of great value to to customers, and I would say we see it in a way that um, you know we see what people are choosing to do, and then see what's actually happening in the system, and feel we can can really help people by saying, "Hey, we see that you're making this choice, but if you knew what's happening in the rest of the world, you might make a different choice, and that will help you, you know, deliver more effectively, deliver faster." So um, whether that's yeah, I think you you referred to sort of trained models and inference like yeah um interpreting the actions nets, of folks like, basically know, the yeah. development in neural nets has just been astounding and yeah um, it it's i i mean i uh i think in the late 90s when i got into industry we were talking about neural nets like they were just around the corner and you know ai was going to do everything and and we sort of kicked that down the road for a long time but we're seeing this this transition point now where the tools are available to the masses, right? Where I can get open source libraries or even better, just hosted systems that I can say, cool, here's my model, right? This is what I want to know right. and get, get stuff back very, very quickly. And so the ability of all developers to be able to take that and integrate that into what they're doing, I think is a really, uh, really fascinating opportunity. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, was that um, out of curious? Just as we we never made it back into history, while well, we've kind of dabbled in history anyway. But um, in, in terms of things that you're seeing as current trends, like obviously you're seeing a lot around security, and I do think, you know, rep recognizing patterns, which is what you know a lot of machine learning is really good at, uh, much faster than humans, is something that is helpful in the security world. Um, but is there kind of other applications of of AI or ML that you were you know, this, that have been coming up for you recently? Oh, uh, I, I think it's more personal interest than mm -hmm. anything else. Um, um, the, uh, you know, the changes really started in 2012, right? When uh, we, there, in, 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 you know, especially up in Toronto, where there were just so many kind of breakthroughs made. And we, uh, start seeing really the kind of the the application of uh computer vision um and you know i 
I'm still a kind of a student, I, you know, I think as, as, as much as anyone else, I'm like a, you know, a beginning student in this, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering how much longer we can keep up the, uh, the work of this complexity um, and just have it abstracted more, uh, which is interesting because I'm so confused by this concept of low code. I don't know how to define it anymore. I, you know, it's, and it's funny, it's really popular, um, mm -hmm. um, you know, as a topic on the new stack, but only when it's like addressed for pr like professionals, right? You know, the, I think the, the overall kind of readership of the new stack isn't really interested in low code for, you know, people who don't know how to code. Mm -hmm. you know, they want to, uh, they want to understand about low code as it applies to their work. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's this fine line between innovation and low code that I'm trying to better understand because it's not so clear to me like that low code is people would consider, people do consider it its own category. And I get that. Yeah. But professional developers are interested in the topic because there's so much that they need to manage mm -hmm. that they have to, uh, they have to have some understanding of things that are very much of an abstract, you know, in a very abstracted kind of a way. And so this gets into conversations, I think about, you know, uh, the technologies that we've seen over the past, you know, nine or 10 years, um, in artificial intelligence and, you know, and how we think of, of decentralized architectures and like, what are you going to actually be able to program, you know, at, you know, at the very kind of edge of the network, right. You know, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and can we teach that a lot more easily to people based upon these principles of low code and, you know, neural net. So they don't have to necessarily have to be thinking about all these things that really, I think are, making our work increasingly complex. Like I think about a topic like, a, like a observability, it's just going to get more that way. It's going to get more and more to this real granular level of like trying to understand what the heck's going on. Well, you I think that there's, I, I'm fascinated by this low code concept and, and your notion of professional developers. Like when I think about that, I think about, I'll just call it boilerplate, right? Like what's the stuff that I do every day that's not right. creative, not really taking advantage of everything that I know about the customer, about building software. It's just, oh yeah, in order to do that, I need to type these 50 lines. So let me get them out of the way and then I can move on to doing the real valuable thing, which is different from, okay, I don't really know much about software, but if I drag this thing and this thing over here, then maybe I'll build yeah. a system that's going to be great. Yeah. Those are very, very different things. And very different. I, I was thinking about this, I'm going to get myself probably in a lot of trouble with an audience that I, I have no right to be talking about. But when I when I meet designers who are really capable of of doing design work on a digital interface, I tend to find that they can also draw with a pencil. Yes, and that folks that can only do things you know in a digital interface because they don't have those kind of fundamental mechanics don't reach the same level in a way. Do you, do you know what I mean? And yeah. I, I again, I don't know if that's particularly accurate, but I've always it's thought of it that way. The mind to the into the work in many ways. But. Right. And so having the foundation as a software developer or, or however you want to think about that role, and then being able to say, oh, well, this it's way easier if I just take this building block is very different from not having a foundation and saying, I don't need a foundation because I have a bunch of building blocks so I can build a great service. Right. And maybe it's the like kind of my, my more negative side, but I've spent a lot of my time fixing problems in software, right? That's what happens when you build a lot of software is you fix a lot of problems. And when I fix problems, I don't get to operate at this, at this really high level, right? What we consider the low code level. I have to understand that this is doing this thing because it's stacked on top of this, that's stacked on top of this, that's stacked on top of this. And now I need to be able to dive down into that. And so I'm, I'm fascinated by this concept. How do we enable more folks to deliver effectively? but also give them the deep understanding that they're rarely using of how this stuff works underneath in order to, to be able to string it together effectively. Right. And really yeah. understand the, the impact of what they're, what they're building. I don't know. It's, it's a tricky one. Like I think uh, what I'm taking away from all of this, which I, I feel like is what I take away a lot is we've created a lot of complexity. We've solved a lot of complexity. The complexity keeps moving. We force ourselves to learn new tools to manage it. 
Uh, but we always keep building great things in the end. So it can't all be bad. Um, I don't know. I mean, what's your, uh, if you were to wrap it all up right now at this, at this particular point in software development, you've been in this for a long time, you know, are we making it better for ourselves or are we making it worse for ourselves? Mm. I think one of the, kind of the, the questions I have, when does it go beyond, uh, you know, the laptop and the desktop and the, you know, the device and your phone and into the, to everything that we really know of. And, you know, that's where I, I I'm curious about, because if like, you know, one of the things I learned a long time ago when I was just learning about, um, you know, tech reporting and, you know, what was really interesting to me was like that, the concept that everything is a node, you know, everything is a node. This coffee cup, you can't see it in the podcast, but, you know, uh, you know, a coffee cup could essentially be considered as um, a data object in, mm -hmm. in some ways. A table could be considered a data yeah, but, but much more realistically, a data center is, is, is a data object. A, uh, a server in a data center is a data object. And, you know, it, or is an, it, more so than a data object is more like a, you know, a server is like a, is a node. Like, and so um, a, a data center is a node, like your house can be a node, you know, a car can be a node, right? And then, so like for me, the interesting questions that come are like, well, is everything is a node, right? And like everything could be programmed. Now we're going to get into some of the issues of latency we've never, ever seen before, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and that to me is kind of one of the big interesting things I'm curious about as kind of the, as, as the world becomes increasingly decentralized, you know, how do we, how do we think of these programmable nodes and how do we manage them so they're actually usable? You know, mm. and so will that, you know, does that mean, you know, that, um, you know, what does that mean? It means to me that you know, on, on the plus side, it's going to require a lot more people to program. It's going to require a lot more people who um, have never thought about programming, um, but are just going to end up uh, doing it. Um, so that means that, you know, to program the internet, Solomon Hikes talked about programming the internet when he was starting Docker and like the people at Docker were talking about programming the internet. And they, and I think that was really the kind of the, the beauty behind the Docker itself is they had, they had this, they had this belief about the experience um, that I think was, uh, was transforming for a lot of people, right? You know, mm -hmm. to really make it simple, to make it elegant. And, and I think Solomon, you know, has always been, um, a, you know, been a, a dreamer in many ways where like he, he, you know, he's like had this dream of like the, of the internet becoming programmable, you know, and, and that's kind of a philosophy that I think we carry at the new stack. It's like, that's what we believe. We believe that the internet is programmable and that's why we call it the new stack. It's services and software and sophisticated, fast and distributed infrastructure. And that means it can be anything. And is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. But, but it means that, you know, that we can think about the people who actually do this program and who are those people. And I think in our industry, it's, it's, it's been pretty much, you know, dominated by people like you and me, people who look like you and me, right? You know, and so my question is like, how is that community going to really grow and expand? How's it going to really extend? Because you're going to need a lot more skill sets and you're going to need a lot more people to kind of build that kind of that infrastructure and build that architecture to make it programmable over time. So I, that's why I think, you know, these concepts are really critical, like pro programmable, um, like, uh, you know, pr programmable infrastructure, like we're talking at the beginning of our call or, you know, or even kind of low code environments where, you know, you can do the basic, you know, the basic work without having to think about the complexities. Yeah. What I, what I love in that, as you, as you paint that picture, you know, I, as I said, I think about like all the errors that can happen and you needing to know all these underlying pieces of the system, but, but to truly enable the masses, right? Can you create abstractions that are resilient to those errors and give people building blocks who are, I guess, looking at the problem in a different enough way that they don't feel the constraints of all the underlying systems and can truly go build things that we would never imagine, right? That, yeah. that folks who are, you know, that's, that's the reality is I feel constrained by all of that knowledge of, of how the system has to work underneath. And if you didn't have that constraint, would you push the envelope and build something, you know, 
with my house as the node that did something I, I, I never would have conceived of. Um, it's such a cool thing to think about. And we're totally over time. So I'm going to wrap yeah. it up there. Alex, thank you so much for joining and for painting such a broad picture of everything that you see happening. I, I think there's, you know, it's a fascinating industry to think about. I do think we're at a cool time. Lots of stuff is changing. There's always new opportunities um, and getting, you know, such a broad view from someone who gets to see so much of it um, is, is just really, really awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, uh, we love our work at the new stack and part of the, part of the benefits is the chance to talk with people like you, Rob. So thank you for having me on your show and love your uh, hosting as a, uh, in podcast. You're a really good um, podcast host. We're going to have to hire you someday. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be happy to guest host if you're, if you're absent for some reason, I'll, I really enjoy doing this anyway. Um, thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who, uh, who tuned in to listen to this. If you're liking what you hear, subscribe on your, uh, on your favorite podcast provider. If you want us to be talking to someone or about something, uh, find us on Twitter at circle CI Alex. Again, thank you so much. Big fan of the new stack, big fan of everything that you, uh, that you always bring to the table. Thanks a lot. <laughs>